on the eve of the 2020 elections, I'm here to share with you, the friends and fellow citizens community, a few things to keep in mind as we progress through our democratic process once again. Let's get started. Patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Friends and Fellow Citizens. As usual, I'm your host, Sherman Tylosky here. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you will enjoy this episode and many others as we continue with our strong foundation of Washington's principles as I've continued that series and wrapping up hopefully by the end of the year, as well as our fantastic interview shows And a great thank you to all of our guests so far as we reach the 2020 election season, or towards the end of it, I should say. Before I get started into what I want to say for this episode, I want to make clear that this episode, I don't think it should just be for 2020. Hopefully we will look back at this episode, we will think about the things that we have accomplished over the last couple months here on this podcast, but more importantly, what the United States of America has accomplished as we hit another election cycle. And I want to thank all of you for those who have voted, for those who are planning to vote, and for those who are participating in our democratic process. I think it's important to have as many people as we can to voice genuine opinions and to be able to exercise that right to vote. That right to vote is so critical. I want to first of all thank our first responders. As election day comes around tomorrow and for future election days well into the future, they have been on the front lines of keeping our citizens safe. While we do want accountability amongst first responders, we want to thank the vast majority who serve for the American people every single day, regardless of people's backgrounds or political affiliations or differences. Secondly, I also want to thank our military. The military has supported the United States and the American people for years and years, and they have fought and sacrificed so much for this country, for people to have the right to vote in this federal republic. I want to thank those serving in the military and veterans and those whom we have unfortunately lost. We cannot thank these men and women enough for what they have done for this great nation. And third, I want to thank those who are working at the polls, ensuring that we have a fair election process. Also to the intelligence officials who are out there monitoring for election interference For those who are trying their best without regard to politics, ensuring that our democracy is as safe as possible. I want to thank these people in particular as well. There are truly a number of people we owe appreciation towards as we are able to participate in this process of electing either the current president, Donald Trump, or a President Joe Biden. One fun fact that I think a lot of people might miss is that regardless of who wins this election, this will mark either the first president from Florida to win a presidential election or the first president from the state of Delaware to become president. I think that's a really nice fun fact. I think for all of us, I wanted to share that with you today. To President Trump and Vice President Pence, and to candidate and former Vice President Joe Biden with his running mate, California Senator Kamala Harris, good luck. And I want to take this opportunity to wish good luck to all the candidates 
for federal, state, and local offices. In today's episode, I want to share with you three main things that i like all of us to keep in mind. This episode is not about the campaigns themselves. I think there's plenty of information for voters to be able to access, to read about. I know that people are very invested in the policies, in the candidates, but I really don't think that this episode would be particularly useful if it was just a reiteration of the campaigns. I think the campaigns should speak for themselves. Rather, this episode is to unite all of us so that regardless of whoever wins on November 4th or whenever the election results are certified and approved, that we all understand and appreciate the democratic process and that we move forward to address the issues that are ongoing right now. Issues ranging from the pandemic to the economy to social unrest, these issues are not going away on election day. I think we need to remember the context of this election compared to maybe any election that we've participated in or not participated in. And this leads to my first point that I'd like you all to remember. We hear a lot about candidates saying this is the most important election of our lifetime. I'll tell you exactly why it's the most important election. 2020 is the most important election in the history of our country because it's the only one that hasn't been decided yet. It's the most important election since the last election. And while that sounds obvious, I really take into concern the people who say that if so-and-so wins, that things will go crazy, that things will go terrible, and uh, the country will be on on fire and everything. I mean, let's, let's set that aside, all right? Let's put things into perspective. Take this op-ed that I found on the Boston Globe, an October 14th, 2020 opinion by Jeff Jacoby. And he explains this idea of the most important election in the history of our country that you hear from both candidates. And he used a really great example, actually two great examples, that show how crazy this expression really is when you look at the grand scheme of things. Benjamin Harrison and Grover Cleveland faced off for the second time in the year 1888. At that time, the New York Times told his readers that, quote, the Republic is approaching what is to be one of the most important elections in its history, unquote. I wonder how many people would even know who ran in 1888, with the exception of history buffs, of course. This is another example of how when people are fixated during election year, and rightly so, sometimes there is a tendency to think that all stakes are on the table. And I'm here to tell you that that is not the case with 2020. It will not be the case for 2024 or 2048 or any election far into the future. It's true that every election is important. I know that people might say that, well, you know, I, I don't think my vote counts or things are not going to change. Well, things are only going to change if votes count. And that's why I think voting is one of the most important democratic exercises we can do as citizens of the United States and of any country in the entire world. Here's another example from the same article. It says, quote, in a lengthy editorial 20 years earlier in 1868, the Atlantic Monthly excoriated the Democratic Party and said of the upcoming 1868 presidential election, and they said, quote, it would indeed be no exaggeration to say that it will be the most important election that Americans ever have known, unquote. The election of 1868. Who thinks about that election anymore? It was the first election since the aftermath of the Civil War. But it was such an exaggeration at the time and still is today. 
The interesting thing about that election, real quick, is that Horatio Seymour might have been the only major candidate in that election who thought that it wasn't the most important election because he actually did not want to be the nominee for the Democratic Party. He was running against Republican candidate Ulysses Grant, who was quite popular as a union general, not popular among the South, of course. But it's it's really weird how Horatio Seymour, a guy who badly did not want the nomination, actually got it. I don't think that will ever happen anymore. I don't think we will have another Horatio Seymour. I don't even know if there's that many people named Horatio, let alone the name Horatio Seymour. But there you go. The point is, every election does seem like the most important election because we are the ones voting in it. Because there's no other election that's going on right now. Either past elections have decided or future elections have not even started. And I think having that context is really key. I just cannot begin to imagine why some people want to go out on a limb and say that everything is at stake. When in fact, our system is built for stability. One of the things I, we love about the American system is that you can have different administrations, Republican and Democrat, and you can still have things still working. There are still opportunities for people to do internships, to do campaign work, run for office, participate in civic groups. There's still so many opportunities out there, and no election will ever take those opportunities away from the American people. I guarantee that. So make sure that you continue to participate in the election process and the democratic process, regardless of whoever wins the White House, and certainly regardless of whoever occupies whatever seat. I always tell people that if you don't vote, you don't count. So make sure that you take into the consideration the numerous opportunities that people will still have after November 3rd, 2020. And maybe from a more practical explanation point of view, if people only lived in polarizing times, if someone were to live largely in misery for four to eight years because that person is party A and the occupant of the White House is party B, and that person will only be happy when the president and that individual shared the same party identification. Is that really the way we want to live? We want to live our lives so that we are always unhappy when someone at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest is of a different party, and yet we don't even think about those opportunities to be able to do what's best for the country at a local, state, and federal level? I think that's something to think about. And that's why I really don't want people to feel dejected or distraught if their candidate didn't win. Find opportunities, find democratic opportunities to serve back to your country. Your country needs you. As a citizen, you hold that passport high up in the air because this country is on a track to make a positive difference in the world, whether it's on human rights, whether it's on the economy or security or great education. There are so many things we still can do and make better in this country and around the world. Let's keep it that way. Let's keep striving to do what is right for our country. So that's my first point. Keeping this election into context. Number two, I cannot emphasize the importance of voting. As I mentioned earlier, if you don't vote, you don't count. I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again because it really is that important. People often say, well, my vote doesn't count. Maybe it's because of the way districts are drawn. Gerrymandering is a big issue. The courts so far have not really made substantial decisions on them. They've largely deferred gerrymandering decisions back to lower courts, which arguably doesn't solve the problem of members of Congress or other representatives not being able to represent the true political landscape of their respective districts. I get it. I think we all do. 
sometimes you might feel that, well, I'm in a very Democrat district or very Republican district, and I want to vote in a different way. I probably shouldn't vote. I get that people feel that way. I also believe that people should not be compelled to vote. I've heard people saying that 100% of the American people who are eligible to vote should vote. I disagree with that. I think there is an element of freedom to choose whether or not to vote. I encourage people to vote not because I'm a get-out-the-vote activist or that I expect anything particular from other people. I say this because I have faith in the American system. Voting is one of the big equalizers in terms of the basic democratic rights of each citizen. No matter how wealthy or how powerful someone is, they only count as one vote, just like your vote. I think this is one of the great equalizers in any republic, in any democracy. Because we can't allow forces or organizations or other forms of power to dictate how we should be governed. There's a reason why we the people are the first three words of the Constitution. It's not we the government, not we Washington, D.C. It's we the people. Let's never forget that. I want to reiterate one thing that Dr. Norris, my guest from the last week, said about the United States. We really do have an exceptional country. There are many countries out there where, unfortunately, democracy has not reached the people. I think the fight is not over. It's not over for places ranging from China to Belarus, from Russia to North Korea. We have a long way to go for democracy across the entire world. It's going to be such a challenge, but I'm grateful that we are living in a country where we can exercise this right to vote, and there's countless people before even our times, who fought for the rights of the American people to make the final decisions on whom should be in power. So I encourage all of you to vote if you haven't already. If you choose not to vote, I completely respect your decision. I don't believe anyone should be demeaning someone just because they didn't vote. I really think that's a problem amongst certain people. People should be living in the freest nation on earth, and we should keep it that way here in America. The third reminder I'd like to give all of you is to always take the high ground. What do I mean by that? I really mean taking the moral high ground in the sense that one should genuinely and always take the kinds of actions that promote goodness and unity. As we are all too familiar with, our country is deeply divided. We might not have been divided as much as we are today since the Civil War. Maybe. It's not a fact, but it does kind of feel that way, maybe. And the things we should keep in mind are that no matter what people might think about a candidate or how they vote, or whether or not they choose to vote, let's respect their opinion. Let's respect the fact that people might just want the same things, but they believe that a different candidate will deliver those same values or those same kinds of policy issues that we all care about. One of the things I really am concerned about is when people fight after each other, go after each other, but not because of policy differences, but because one person thinks that the other is inherently evil. I mean, how outrageous does it have to be? And how absurd do people have to truly live their lives when they are going on character attacks? It is unacceptable. I will condemn any looting, any rioting, that occurs after this election. This is not an authoritarian regime. Regardless of what you think of the president, regardless of what you think of Joe Biden, always be on the good side. 
And I'm confident that the listeners of Friends and Fellow Citizens will be on the good side, will do whatever they can to unite people. Because we really need that. This country needs you to unite, not divide. It could be that the election results will take some time amidst mail-in voting, amidst the pandemic. There's going to be certain administrative bureaucratic bureaucratic issues. But that's not ever going to be a justification for violence. It will never be a justification for threats for unruly behavior. And I think if anyone were to take point number three as a means to make their ideology or position better, it's probably one of the greatest things you can do for your campaign and what you stand for. No one wants to align themselves with anyone who treats them terribly. I was talking to my friend a little while ago we were saying how there's people who were blocking the highway down somewhere, I think, in Berkeley. And my friend, who leans a particular way, was saying that, you know, this is ridiculous because there's people blocking traffic, shouting all these obscenities. And he's saying there's probably a lot of drivers there thinking, I agree with you, but I also want to get home. And I don't think that it's particularly useful when people engage in really reckless civil disobedience to violent crimes. And I'm really hoping that our leaders and our police departments will enforce the law to the greatest extent without infringing on civil liberties. Let's treat everybody as innocent until proven guilty. But I'm really hoping that our law enforcement, our first responders will ensure that people will remain safe. We really need the safety. We also need the liberty as well. If people protest because they don't like a decision, they have the right to do so. But to those who engage even in peaceful protests, just understand that flipping the middle finger at someone is not going to make them like you. When was the last time anyone was called the worst possible names in the dictionary, and all of a sudden, like, oh my goodness, I love you so much. I love the position that you take. It it never happens. <laughs> it's really crazy how people actually believe that if they were to behave in the most childish ways and the most criminal behaviors, that people actually would buy into what they are saying. It's it's nonsense. But I know that all of you will take into account our system and understand that civility really is the best way to go. If anything, I think protests are simply more of an emotional outburst. I think social media kind of plays a part in that, of people maybe stuck in echo chambers, not realizing that maybe someone else running for president, running for office, might even have similar views on certain issues. The point being Just because there is a way to exercise one's rights doesn't mean that it's the most effective. But more civility is what is going to bring our country progress and peace and prosperity. So those are my three items. First is to keep this election to perspective. Second is to participate in the civics process by voting or other means to Put your voice out there. Number three is to act civil by taking the moral high ground. And I know that all of you will do those three things, regardless of what the results are. This is an important election. A lot of decisions will have to be made, whoever is elected to office. Our electoral process is what spans generations. These are institutions, not elections. Elections are a one-time thing every once in a while. Again, they are important, but remember the institutions. Remember how we get to where we are today. And one last thing is that I encourage you to make yourself available for those 
who were on the losing side of this election. If someone wants to speak with someone, just wants to air their grievances, just wants to be able to know that other people care about Americans regardless of political differences, do it. Be there for them. To conclude this episode and refer back to our values and the principle encompassing title that binds us together on this podcast, be there for your friends and fellow citizens. Tell them that the American Republic will still stand robust and it will never cease in its mission to make the lives of Americans and countless people around the world better than yesterday. Be there for your friends and fellow citizens. Again, thank you so much for listening to this episode. As a kind reminder, make sure you subscribe and share this episode and podcast with your friends, family, and fellow citizens. Take care and so long.